Hey, I just want to welcome you and say thank you for watching online. You know, here at The Church Next Door, we believe that your life is important, and that's why we've taken the time to put these videos out there. I hope it's encouraging you and inspiring you, but why not stop by sometime? Come on a Saturday night, 5 o'clock, join us for worship, or Sunday morning at 9.30 or maybe at 11. Either way, pick a time and just stop by. Get to know the people of The Church Next Door. That's exciting. That's just the first seven months of the year and what we've reached out and done so far. Let's give God a hand clap, all right? Literally thousands of people's lives have been touched through you uh, personally, hands-on, and through your prayers. And just, it's been a wonderful, we're so excited. Hey, do me a favor, look to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. That's so good, all right? Now, do me a favor, put your hands together and welcome those who are going to watch us online. Just say, hey, welcome to the church next door. We're glad you're here. This could be your first step, but keep on going, all right? Well, today we're starting a new series, and it's called The Conquest. And it, it's all about just these anxieties that we feel in life. Every one of us has to face the pressure of life. Now, I realize that in every generation, we look at our own lives, we look at our situation and the transformation of, of the world around us, and we come to the conclusion that our condition is worse than any other generation before. That's just because we're selfish, okay? And it could be that our situation is worse than others before. It might not be. But, but the reality is you and I live in an anxious world because we're so visible to everybody. I mean, we live our lives in a world where at any moment someone can catch you on video and they can put out your mistake for everybody to see that you tripped on their way in to Walmart, right? I mean, we can just make a little error and, and, and we don't even know they're watching and they can make fun of us. So we feel the vulnerability and so it makes us anxious and we we're a little bit concerned because there's like this competition that's going on in our world because we're constantly looking at everybody's lives online and we're evaluating, well, how am I doing compared to everybody else? And then what do we do? We get a little depressed because, you know, they're doing better than we are. And then, you know, then we're like, oh my, comparison comes in and see, that's the problem. We live in a world where we are just 
present with everybody all the time. And sometimes we got to figure out, well, how do I get victory over just the anxieties of life, of, of living in a world that's so visible this way? We're going to walk through that over the next several weeks, but this week I want to give you the first key principle. And, and the key principle is this, is you have to be willing to be vulnerable because we're all vulnerable. And the only way you can win a, in any battle, the only way you can win is to fight it. You will lose if you choose to sit in the stands and only watch it. You have to participate to win. And in order to win, you have to participate. And that means you have to be vulnerable to the attack. So I thought, who better than to start than to me? So I thought, I better be a little bit vulnerable. And so one of the things I want to tell you about me is this. I've always struggled with what to wear. I've, I've never been a snazzy dresser. I mean, like, even before I come to church, every time I like look over at Jim and say, does this look okay? You know, I need that reassurance because I know, okay, they do not have adult gur animals. I don't even know that they create gur animals for kids anymore, all right? When I was a kid, when I was a, a small kid, you know, my mom would always stack my clothes so that I knew this shirt goes with these pants. You know what I'm saying? And then even then I would mess it up. When I was a little guy, my brothers still give me a hard time. I know that's their job as brothers to give me a hard time. I made it so much easier for them. One day, one day my mom just mentioned the fact that the boys had gone back to school and my mom minced them. And so I decided that I would walk through our neighborhood to the elementary school where my brothers went and tell them that mom wanted them to come home. Now, this will frighten you parents. I was three years old. I made it to the school. I found the principal. I found my brother. Actually, I found both of them. Alan was selected to be the one to re-deliver me home. I had my pants on backwards. Yeah, buddy. Now, why do I tell you that? Because I'm going to show you another vulnerable picture for my clothing attire right here. This is me. My dad says I was about age five. This is, I'm, I'm the one in the overalls. I just want to help you out there. That was my pony. We named him Clown Spur. We called him Spur. I received him from a man that had a herd, hear this, a herd of over 100 miniatures. This man, so it was like kind of like, it was like walking into the world of the tiny horses. You know what I'm saying? You get out of your car and you'd look across the pasture and there were all these little tiny horses. And he looked at me one day, he said, Doyle, if you'd like, you can have that one. He's too big. <laughs> yeah, he, at, at, at his, uh, at the bottom of his neck, the, the top of his back, he was actually shorter than this thing. He was tiny. And, 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 and I was so proud of this pony. One day, one day, my mom had one of her friends over to the house, and we had this glass top table that sat in the, in the kitchen, and there was a big bay window, and my mom's friend was sitting at the table looking out the window across our patio to the lawn, and I decided to ride Spur up there to, to show off my, my pony and my equestrian abilities, all right? And I fell off. Well, when I came into the house, my mom's friend said, I saw you fall off your pony. And I denied it. <laughs> yeah, none of you would ever do that. And I denied it vociferously. And she pushed back on me. Because she really realized that you need to realize this is not really a good character quality in you to deny that you obviously fell off your pony, you know what I'm saying? And, and yet I denied it. it. This is what I learned in that process. We all hate to be vulnerable. We all hate to admit our mistakes. And it is our sinful nature within us that wants to deny we're not what we want to be. See, it's hard to admit that we're not snazzy dressers. It's hard to admit that we need other people's help. It's hard to admit and to be vulnerable. But the only pathway, 
the only pathway to victory has to lead to this valley of vulnerability, this, this awareness of our need. We, are, we have a need to, to be honest that we are not perfect, that we are broken people, that we are, are sinful. Just today, to, we're, we're reading to the New Testament, and I hope you'll read with me and follow along because we're reading to the New Testament, and, and you crack it open today. We're in Matthew chapter 3, and Jesus goes down into the valley to be baptized. Why? Why does he need to be baptized? John even argues with him. Jesus, you don't need to be baptized. You're perfect. I need your baptism, John says. And Jesus says, no, I need to do this to be obedient. See, Jesus is, 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 is going through the valley of vulnerability. He's going down into the water to identify that humanity has to admit that it is sinful by nature. He was not sinful, but he wanted to walk through the water so you and I could know that you and I, if we will go through the waters and admit that we're vulnerable, we can be raised to new life. That's what it says in Romans chapter 5. See, you and I have to walk through that. One of the greatest struggles that we have is that we live in a world that is fallen and broken, and you and I are fallen and broken. And if we can admit our vulnerability, then God can heal that part of us. God can fix the brokenness if we're willing to admit it. Until you go to the doctor and say, doctor, something's wrong. He can't help you. Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the well. Jesus came for those that are willing to be vulnerable. Wherever Jesus went, he identified with broken people. Broken people. Why? Because broken people know they're broken. And as long as you're trying to hide your vulnerability and wear a plastic mask and and try to cover up and, and keep it hidden, you cannot get healed. You cannot get freedom. You cannot get the good news of the gospel. It's what keeps us from church. I mean, I used to worry. I used to think, man, that preacher, he can read my mind. I would sit there thinking, He knows what I've been thinking about. I would try not to get eye contact. I understand that. In in Romans, Paul is talking to the church about this struggle with sin and just the reality how Jesus is getting victory and, and how you and I have to know that God loves us. That that nothing can separate us from God's love. Look at these words. It's so, so powerful. It's it's right here. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 and 36. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is no. Say no. no. Oh, that's good. See, nothing can separate you and I from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Then he goes on to describe how clearly we need to keep this understand. Can trouble? No. Pain? No. Persecution? No. Can lack of clothes and food, danger to life and limb, the threat of force of arms? Indeed, some of us know the truth of the ancient text. He's he's quoting Psalm 44. We're going to come back to that. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. What he's saying is this. You and I have to be honest. We live in a world where we, feel, where we feel so vulnerable and we feel like if we don't have the right outfit on, <laughs> they'll reject us. And he says, even if you've got the wrong outfit on, even if you can't afford clothes, God still loves you. He says, you may feel like a sheep. See, sheep, when they go to the slaughter, they don't say anything. They just feel powerless. They're just, you may feel powerless today. But the message of Christ Jesus is this. He stepped into this world. He walked through every valley that you're going to walk through. He's walked through the valleys of temptation. Matthew chapter 4, that's today's reading. Jesus was tempted. Satan looks at him and says, if you are the Son of God. What is, God what, what, is, what is the temptation you and I have to deal with every day? It's the same temptation. Well, if you were really a Christian, 
And what's he try to do? He tries to get us to commit suicide. The suicide rates in our society are so stinking high. We're so anxious, so depressed, so confused. We're confused about who we are. This is what Jesus says. You're God's child. Psalm 82 is part of our reading today. It, it says that God loves all people. That all people are part of God's inheritance. That means every one of us in this room and everyone outside this room throughout the earth, they're part of God's inheritance. What a powerful statement. If you and I are willing to walk through the valley of vulnerability with God, the path to victory goes through the valley of uncertainty. We live in a world, I wrote this down because I want to get the words right. Too much of what we see in here today that is touted as courage is inflated or empty rhetoric that camouflages personal fears. True courage dives in to lead the way despite the fears of failure or vulnerability. That's what Jesus did. See, Jesus stepped into our world to set us free. He was vulnerable to sin in this world so that you and I could have a pathway to victory. When you and I are vulnerable, we can bring other people to freedom. This is what I mean when I say this. I know a couple. They're empty nesters. Their kids are grown. They're out of the home. And, and they determined that with this season of their life, they were going to go visit a local juvenile detention center every week. Every week, they're going to go work with teenagers, and they're going to have a Bible study with them. And they're going to try to encourage them and let them know that Jesus loved them. To share the good news of the gospel to a group of people that have, that have experienced some unbelievably horrible circumstances in their life. Many times, they were trying to do the best they knew how to do, and they still wound up in juvie, right? We have all know, we know people. We've been people in these situations. And this couple... Well, you say, well, there's no risk for that. Yeah, there is. Those kids don't think they're cool. Those kids just want to get out of their room for a little bit. They have to put up with the, with the scoffs and the snickers. And they have, but why? Why do they do that? Because they know if they could just come with one song that would encourage them today to help them open the door to the opportunity of Jesus Christ, they could change the trajectory of these young people's life. Their willingness to be vulnerable is what sets them free. I'll give you another example. I have a friend. When he was setting off to school, where his kids had started school this week, his first week of school, he saw this girl trying to walk to school. She's struggling. The other kids are making fun of her. And he makes a calculated decision in his mind because of what God has done in his home, in his family. He says, I need to help her. He goes, takes her books, and walks with her to school and determines that day he will walk her to school every day. Because of her physical handicap, her special need, he says, I'm going to identify with her so they will stop picking on her. How's he vulnerable? Folks, he's willing to cash in some of his cool chips to shut them up. See, you and I live in a world where some Somebody would videotape the girl going to school. They'd videotape uh, how, how the people are mocking them. Then they post it and shame other people for the way they're treating the kid. What God says is line up along the week and you give them some water. You give them some love. You give them some kindness. That's the way you deal with the evil in our world is you have to be vulnerable yourself. It's time to move past the rhetoric. It's time to roll up your sleeves and be Christ Jesus in the world in which we live. And if you will do it, it's so powerful. And that's why Paul looks at the church and he says, can famine or nakedness or hardship keep you from God's love? Step into the world. Step into it with strength. Step into your fears. And God shows up in the midst of your greatest need. See, that's the pattern. That's the kingdom pattern. And, and our world says, you know, stay at home, hide, stay in the stands, be quiet. And God says, no, no. He says, shout it from the house types that God is good. That's the message of the kingdom of God. 
Ecclesiastes 11.4. This is a powerful wisdom. Solomon's wisdom. It says, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. I would say, whoever watches their social media might not take a step of boldness. See, this is what happens. We look at, the, at, the, at what we see and then we say, too risky for me. See, if you go by your eyes, you won't risk. But God says there's another level. See, God says there's a hidden realm. God says there's a power. There's, there's something greater than what you can see. It's the unseen realm. Keep going. Next verse, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. It says, do you not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb? Can I just answer that question? No. No. Yes, we understand DNA, we understand chromosomes, we understand how uh, the, the, the egg is fertilized. But tell me this, how does it get personality? And how is it that sometimes your children walk the same way you do? How is it that your children, they, they have their own identity and personality when did that come in there? That creativity, that extra little spark that gives them life. In the notes, in the NIV, this is what it says about that, that, that extra is or know how life or the spirit enters the body being formed. We don't know that to this day. Science cannot explain how you get your personality inside that womb. So that when you come, just this week, Jennifer visited a baby in the NIC unit. And she, and she said, this baby is so tiny, so preemie. And yet you can see the, the, the will to live and its personality. See, there's something unseen in this world. So you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. The truth of the matter is that when you and I look at life, there are these invisible things. That The greatest strengths in this world are invisible. The greatest powers. I mean, we, we could talk about nuclear fission and nuclear power and how you can't see it. But we can also talk about some other things that are invisible, that are very powerful. Hope is invisible. Yet hope is what carries us through hard places in life. See, hope is the awareness there's something better on the other side of this valley. Hope is what carries you through. How about gravity? It's invisible, but we see its impact. I stepped on the scale this morning. I'm like, wow, gravity is pulling harder today. <laughs> Couldn't have been dinner last night. You believe in gravity, right? That's invisible. Love is invisible, but we see its impact. Bitterness is also powerful, but it's generally self-destructive. I want to tell you a story of forgiveness. Uh, not long ago, a, a girl called Jennifer and she said, I, I need help. Jennifer said, well, what, what, what's the deal? She said, well, I've been sick for several weeks and um, my dad called me. And Jennifer's like, yeah. And, and, and she said, when I was 10, my dad and my mom broke up. They went through a divorce. It was because of his alcoholism and just the brokenness of their relationship. And because of that, I missed out on having my dad. And, and my dad's being gone and, 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 and not having that in my life has been so painful. And when I was sick, well, I was sick for two weeks and then my dad called me and he said, I heard you've been sick and I just want to call and see how you're doing. And she said, when he called and he said that to me, she said, I did not say this to him, but the thought came into my mind, where were you from age 10 up until now? And she said, because of what Christ Jesus has been doing in her life, her response was actually good. She said, Dad, thanks. I really appreciate that very much. I'm going to be fine. She hung up the phone, and then she picked up the phone, and she called Jennifer and said, I need to forgive. This is not working. And then Jennifer walked her through the process of, of releasing her father from the obligation of making up for the past and trusting Jesus and his work on the cross to bring healing and life to her, to set her free so that she could walk in the good news of the gospel. Now see, that's an invisible force, isn't it? 
That's the power of God that can heal you. And that's what our world desperately needs today. And in order for you and I to walk through the valleys of vulnerability in the unknown, we have to be willing to recognize that at times we're going to get hurt because there's people in this world. And, 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 and as long as there's people in this world, we're going to get hurt in relationships. And the only way to grow and to nurture is to trust God to make up the difference for the sins that are committed against us in the vulnerability of the world in which we live. And that's the, that's the clear victory that God has for every believer. God invites us. He says, hey, trust me. You can trust me. We're able to cross the valley of testing, darkness, loneliness, and risk if we know others have crossed before us. Every time someone crosses that valley and they come through and they testify to you, I want you to know I've made it across. When someone tells you how they were willing to be vulnerable to walk someone else to school, he gives you the courage to say, well, I could walk somebody to school. I could do that. See, God invites us into a community of people, among godly people, who will challenge us constantly to live at his standard rather than our sinful, natural way of living. See, that's the invitation of the kingdom of God. Surround yourself with stories of God's faithfulness for your dark hours, because you will have dark hours. You will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but you can fear no evil because you'll know that God is with you. I believe the reason we overcome depression and anxiety today is if we will know the power of God that can meet us in the midst of that. And I believe that we can share that with other people. That's the principle of Scripture. Look what it says here in Psalm 44. This is the same psalm that's quoted by Peter in this passage. It's just the beginning of the psalm. It says, verse 1, We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. Can I just say this? If you're a grandma and a grandpa, tell the stories of God's victory in your life. Tell the stories of what God has done for you to your children and your grandchildren. Moms and dads, tell your stories. Share your stories with one another because those testimonies of God's faithfulness in the valleys will help carry other people through their valleys. And, and, and we need that encouragement. We need that strength. Verse 2, with your hand you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face. You loved them. Once again, see, this is the reason Paul brings it up. Paul brings up the issue of Christ Jesus' love. The love of God is able to deliver you, deliver you through the valley of vulnerability because that's been God's people. That's always been God's people. God's people have said, I, I may be appear to be in a really bad spot, God, but you know where I am. You have me in your hand. So this is the principle that you want to keep in mind. The strength to rise within, for strength to rise within, we need to slow down and reflect. God's people have always been called to trust Him as the Lord of the Sabbath. Now what's happened is this, is people have legalized it. And they've said, well, there has to be a certain day when I just stop and I can't do anything and, 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 and they did the ritual, but that's not what God said. This is what God invited you to. He said, I want you to take some time, and I want you to make sure that you are, you're, you're setting aside in your heart that you're trusting me in the difficulties of life regularly. Now, yes, he encouraged the people to do that once a week in a day, all right? Now, what I would say to you and I is that because we're out from under the law, it doesn't have to be a particular day. It doesn't have to be Friday. It doesn't have to be Saturday. It doesn't have to be Sunday. But do you have a regular time when you stop and say, God, I just want you to know you're the Lord of my rest. You are the Lord 
of my life. That's what it means to have him be the Lord of the Sabbath. It's when you recognize that he is the one that provides you with your life, your energy, your strength, and your hope. It is not you within yourself. It's not my great wisdom, my great strength that's within me that I'm building up to conquer this life. No, 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 no. It's my awareness that I'm broken and I need a Savior and that He's come in and He's given me new life. And God, thank you. In the same way, you do not have the power to cause the corn to grow. You may have the strength because God gives it to pick it and eat it. But you can't make the corn grow. You can't make the sun come up. And so you stop and say, God, I thank you that the sun rose on me today and I didn't have to shovel snow. (laughs) That's why I'm always happy. All right, there you go. So that's what it means. So do you have a list of God's answers in your life? One of, one of the famous uh, Christians that I, I've liked to read about, his name is George Mueller. George Mueller, um, he had this orphanage that he built in England purely on faith. He said, God, I will not ask anybody for one dime. If you'll bring me the money, I'll bring in an orphan. He kept bringing it in until he had thousands of orphans. He had, he had all these orphans all over the, the city that he was caring for and his team was caring for. And he had a list every day of his prayer requests. And then he would check them off as God answered them. He would write down how God answered the prayer and God met the need. Do you have a list like that? When our boys were growing up, when they were just little bitty guys, we started a a little notebook that we kept um, on our coffee table in our living room. And we would write down the funny things they would say because kids will say funny things. And we just loved them. And then we would also, when we would pray as a family, we would write down our prayer requests. We would write down their prayer requests and we would write down when they got answered. Well, they grow up, and they're teenagers, and they, they'd be sitting there with their friends, and they'd see that book, they'd pull it out, and they'd say, oh, man, I want to, and they'd just start reading that and laughing, being vulnerable, being vulnerable about the silly things that they did and the life that they've lived and talking about their life, and in the midst of that, they would share their prayers and praises, and guess what? It gives hope and life to other people. See, when we are vulnerable... When we are vulnerable, it can give the strength to someone else so they can overcome and experience the life of God. That's the principle that God wants us to live out. Do you have a list? If not, I challenge you to begin to build a list. So clear victory. Where does this this idea that God is the one, he's the power that will walk with us through the valley and give us the clear victory? The next verse in Romans chapter 8 right there. This is where it comes from, all right? It's it's wonderful. It says, no, in all these things. So so it doesn't matter if you're without clothes or you're persecuted. doesn't matter what it is. He says, no, in all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through him who has provided his love for us. The source of your victory through vulnerability, your source of victory in life is Christ Jesus. It's God's love for you. That's what he says. If you can just imagine that somehow God's love could be victorious, this is how it works. In my life, it's easiest for me to be vulnerable with people that love me. Right? The reason I can look at Jennifer and say, hey, is this outfit okay? It's because I know she's not going to disrespect me. She's not going to treat me in some way that, 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 that devalues my personhood. Even though I've been known to wear overalls. <laughs> See what I'm saying? See, love, love is the, is the light that shines in darkness. Love, acceptance, and value. And see, God says, I'm going to give you the overwhelming victory. Now, what's really cool about this, everybody in this room knows about Nike tennis shoes, right? The word there, the word there that says uh, overwhelming victory, clear victory in Greek is Nike, but it's hyper Nike. It's only used in the New Testament one time. It's right here. And it means a super victory. He says that, If you will trust God in the valleys of life, 
If you will trust God in the, in the vulnerable times of your life, if you will look to God, He is going to give you a super victory. And, and the answer is Jesus and trusting Him. So you and I, can we can expect a super victory when we take this pathway that God has given to us. The hard work of trusting God is just staying open. It's just staying open to saying, Okay, God, I'm in a really hard place right now. I don't understand why you would have me in this hard place. But this is what I'm saying. God, I'm trusting that, you, that nothing, nothing evil is going to be successful over my life. That God, you're with me no matter what. That God, you're going to be good to me. I love this. Job chapter 42. Look what it says. This is Job. If anybody had a bad day, it was Job, right? Look what Job says. Job says, I know that you can do all things. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's almost exactly what it says in Philippians, right? I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. See, there's a consistency throughout Scripture, both the Hebrew Bible and, and the, the, the writings of the apostles that you and I treasure so much. That They all say this, that God is the source of strength in life, that God is the one that walks through the valley of the shadow. That's right. And I don't have to be afraid. For you are with me. You are my good shepherd. See, the consistency, the consistency of the nature of God is that you are valuable to Him. And that He's going to love you through. So the question is this, are you and I willing to step down into the water and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your grace. Are you and I willing to walk through the valley of temptation and say, God, I trust your word is more powerful than the evil that's coming against my mind right now that's trying to get me to destroy myself, to give up on you, and to go backwards. See, that's the power of God. In closing, I wanted to read to you Psalm 44, the passage that, 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 that Paul pulls from in Romans. He says, Yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. Awake, Lord! Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. What's he saying? Sometimes you feel like when you're in the valley that God is asleep. He's on the far side of heaven. And you're like, hey, God, I'm here. If you're asleep, it'd be a really good time to wake up. Even though you feel like God is asleep, He's not. He hears you. God knows your status. When Jennifer visited that baby in the hospital, they had an iPad that they just carried around with them. It constantly told them the blood pressure, the heart rate. It told them everything about that baby at all times. I want you to know. God sees you and you are his baby. And he has a constant tap on exactly what's going on right now. And his love is great enough to carry you through. The question I have for you today is this. Do you have the courage to get back up? See, the best thing you can do when you're down is to get up. I want to show you the picture of my pony one more time because I'm such a handsome guy here. Now, this is what I want you to know. We don't ride horses much anymore. Our culture is, has, has moved on from that. But I'm telling you, if there's one thing I learned about owning horses all my life, you got to get back up. You got to get back up. You got to get back up. And I don't know what you've been going through. You may be in a thumbs up, God is great kind of day, good. But when you do go through the valley and you get knocked down into the dust, get back up. Say, I'm getting up as a testimony I trust in you. The reason I come to church and I worship God 
It's because, I, God, I'm trusting you no matter what. I, I was thinking about it today because I knew it was talking about vulnerability. I thought, man, Sam and Anna and the worship team, they are so awesome. They walk out here and they're willing to be vulnerable so that we can worship God. We come all in here and we got all sourpuss face. I want to worship Jesus. And they just worship to pull you in. See, when you're vulnerable, when you're willing to be vulnerable, what you do is you give someone else the strength and the courage to overcome their brokenness, their shame, the hard place, the valley they're in. Be vulnerable. It brings a victory for you and it brings a victory for them. Be vulnerable. Share your stuff. Share your story. Share how God has helped you overcome the sins of the past and that that's no longer winning in your life and you'll bring victory for other people. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. I want to say a prayer over you and this is what I want you to know. There's always a team after church. They want to pray with you. And if you're walking through the valley today, if you're having a hard place, if you just want to invite Jesus into your life, you come down here and talk to them. They're going to agree with you. They're going to pray with you that God is the answer. Heavenly Father, we came to church because we wanted to meet you. And we have, in the midst of the people, in the midst of your word, we've been encouraged. And we just want to say this, God, thank you. Thank you that you've never forgot us. You've never fallen asleep, that you're very well aware of us. And God, we're getting back up today. We're trusting you and we're trusting in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day. Hey guys, if you have enjoyed what you've been listening and been encouraged in your faith or somehow God has answered a prayer from being a part of uh, the Church Next Door online, do me a favor, shoot me an email to pastor at tcnd.org. This pastor at tcnd.org or like me on Facebook, send me a message. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.